All right, my name is Kelly Freeman. I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker of the night, Kevin Roos. He was raised a liberal Quaker and attended Brown University. He decided his sophomore year to go uh, study abroad at Liberty University, which was made for an interesting book, I guess. <laughs> um, there's a lot of virtues that are associated with the atheist movement, if you're on our side, I suppose, um, like rational thought, critical thought, even compassion. However, there are some things that are not often associated, such as Kevin Roos's steel innards. And by innards, I mean guts, because he's got them. But uh, yeah, let's give a hand for him. Hi, guys. So, um, so Liz told you a little bit about me and my book, uh, the, Un the Unlikely Disciple. Um, I want to share quickly the story of how I ended up at Liberty University and, and sort of what's happened since and what I learned. And then I want to do a bunch of questions. So I'll try to keep this uh, mercifully short. Um, so I was 19. I was a, a sophomore in college. And I, was, I wanted to be a journalist. I was working for a writer named A.J. Jacobs who wrote a, book, a great book called The Year of Living Biblically. Some of you might have read. And, uh, and as part of that book, A.J. and I were down in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, doing research. He was researching Jerry Falwell. We went to his church. And I ran across a group of students from Liberty University. At the time, I was at Brown. This is Brown's Crest. Um, I was a pretty normal college student. Uh, my parents are secular Quakers who once worked for Ralph Nader. Uh, I grew up uh, steeped in uh, free thought, steeped in rational thinking, steeped in uh, the values of the progressive movement. This was my world. And then I, I went to Brown, which is basically a notch or two above Sodom and Gomorrah uh, <laughs> by, by Jerry Falwell standards, uh, sang in an acapella group. That's, so I, I was a very typical liberal arts student. Um, and when I met this group of students from Liberty University, oh, we're back, we're back dark again. Oh dear. Are we back? Yeah. We're back. Okay, Liberty University. Liberty is the world's largest evangelical Christian university. It has about 13,000 students on campus and about 40 more off campus, 40,000 40, more taking classes online. So you add everyone together, graduate programs, about 60,000 students. And it's in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, the goal was to make it the evangelical equivalent of Notre Dame or BYU, a place where uh, students who are evangelical Christians could come to be equipped to take on the secular world in all walks of life. So doctors, lawyers, missionaries, business people, pastors. Um, and it was founded, of course, by Jerry Falwell. I have a little video of here, but we don't have an audio hookup, so, so you'll just have to imagine that. Uh, Jerry Falwell was, of course, uh, the pastor who founded the Moral Majority. He was uh, a lion of old school evangelism. He, was, he uh, mobilized millions of Christian voters to elect Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, and in his later years, he became uh, infamous for saying things like, uh, you know, 9-11 was caused by uh, proliferation of gays, lesbians, feminists, atheists, agnostics, uh, the ACLU, people for the American way, uh, as I like to call them, my, uh, my Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> so so he, was, he was not... Uh, part of my upbringing. That was not uh, one of my, I did not have a poster of him above my bed, to put it mildly. Um, but when I started talking to the, the students from Liberty, one of the first things they told me about uh, was Liberty's 46-page code of conduct called the Liberty Way. Uh, it actually, it doesn't come in tablet form, uh, but uh, one, of my, one of my friends uh, did this mock-up for me. And uh, so you can see it, it's a, no drinking, no smoking, uh, no, no cursing, no dancing, no R-rated movies, and uh, last but not least, no hugs that last for longer than three seconds <laughs> between men and women. So I, I, never, uh, I never found out whether it's okay to, to, to you know, hug for three seconds and then release and hug again. I, I, didn't know, I don't know what the ruling is on repeat hugging, but uh, I never tested that one out. If any of you want to do a follow-up, that would be a, a good question to answer. Um, but I thought this, is, this was fascinating. Um, as someone who had never come into contact with the religious right, um, what I felt first was a sense of shock at how different it was from my upbringing. 
And the second thing I felt was a deep shame um, that I knew so little about these people who were my age, in my time zone, in, you know, in a similar collegiate setting. You know, in, in, they were all, we were all in college, and yet we could barely communicate. I, I actually would have felt more comfortable um, in Tokyo, getting directions on the street in fluent Japanese. You know, I don't speak Japanese. That's how, that's how crazy it was for me. And so this was at a time in college when all my friends were talking about study abroad. They were going to Rio or Prague or Barcelona to learn about different cultures and come back um, with a greater understanding of, of the world we live in. And I thought, what better place to do a study of a culture foreign to me than Liberty University? So I wonder if I could get in as a student and go undercover and, and work on a journalistic project about this school and, and see if I could build a bridge there, see if I could find anything uh, that I had in common. So I transferred in the middle of my sophomore year. Uh, that's me on my first day, uh, looking very nervous uh, in front of Liberty University. Um, and and the, there were a couple things I noticed about the campus first. Um, one was that I needed to do a lot of catch up. Uh, I didn't grow up in a family that read the Bible. Um, and so my knowledge was basically limited to you know, the parts that end up on Veggie Tales or in Jim Carrey movies. Um, so so I, I had to do a lot of quick study. This is actually a great book. Uh, I also had to learn about um, Christian social traditions, things, that, things like praying before meals, things like saying blessed instead of lucky. I mean, it really was like learning a second language. Um, and so I had a, a lot of catch-up to do. But mostly in the behavioral realm, uh, I had to figure out how I was going to get through this semester without getting expelled. I mean, every rule in the Liberty Rule Book is accompanied by, uh, by monetary fines and what's called reprimands, basically demerits. So if I wasn't careful, I could end up with a, a huge debt to Liberty uh, and, and probably getting kicked out. So I bought a book called 30 Days to Taming Your Tongue. It's a book that teaches uh, Christians how to avoid cursing. Um, and and uh, of course, Liberty students don't curse, but they, they say basically network TV versions of curses, you know, darn and crap and things like that. So I, but I, I didn't know that. All I knew was this book. And I think the book is a little outdated. It, it uh, was written in the 70s, and so it has all this advice, like, you know, instead of cursing, you should say uh, exclamations that honor God, like, uh, like, mercy and glory be, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so picture, I'm, I'm new to this campus, and I'm walking around in my penny loafers and my, my cardigans, and, you know, and, and saying, glory be, you know, and, and, <laughs> and everyone's just looking at me, like, who is this weird homeschooled kid, and, like, <laughs> How is he ever going to make it here? Um, so it was not like that. It was not a bunch of beaver cleavers. It was, it was not um, an experience of, you know, they're not all uh, Kenneth the Page from 30 Rock. Um, so I immediately jumped in and, and started trying to insinuate myself among, uh, among my evangelical peers. Um, I signed up for a, a chunk of classes. I signed up for what was at, that, at the time the core curriculum of Liberty. So classes in um, Old Testament, New Testament, theology, evangelism 101, and, uh, and creationist biology. So I, I had to take uh, all of those as sort of the classes that every Liberty freshman is required to take. Uh, you can see those are some of my, uh, some of my textbooks there. And, uh, and this was extremely bizarre for me. Um, I remember on the first uh, day of uh, the first exam day of creationist biology, I walked into the class and sat down for the, the, the exam. And question number one was true or false? Noah's Ark was large enough to accommodate various species of dinosaurs. I went, uh, I went, uh, <laughs> let's see, I need this grade. <laughs> So, but, you know, I have prints. So I actually, I went for the grade. I'm sorry, I, I had to do it. I was failing the, you know, I was going to fail the class if I didn't. So I, uh, I did a little bit of, of cognitive dissonance there. Um, then I lived in a dorm. That's my dorm, 22 male. Uh, the dorms are segregated by gender, of course, with no mingling or visitation. Um, and, and I was living with a group of 60 Christian guys, um, and they're divided into prayer groups. They have spiritual life directors. I mean, these are spiritual units. They're not just dorms where people happen to live. Um, and then um, 
uh, I also partook in some extracurriculars. This is not actually a photo I took. This was one Salon.com used to illustrate the excerpt uh, they put up. But I, I tried to do uh, tons of various activities on campus. I joined all the clubs I could find, the Young Republicans, the, you know, the, the Stand with Israel Club. I, I really tried to get uh, in deep there. And, and one of the things I did was a spring break evangelism trip to Daytona Beach, Florida. So during spring break, when everyone is at Senior Frogs, uh, you know, dancing to Kanye, I was there handing out gospel tracts with, with a group of Liberty evangelists. Um, and it produced some bizarre uh, experiences, as you can imagine. I remember one night we were outside a nightclub, uh, late at night, midnight, 1 a.m., uh, witnessing, you know, giving out gospel tracts, telling people about Jesus. And, um, <laughs> and, and a Girls Gone Wild film crew pulled up <laughs> next to us and started shooting on the sidewalk uh, right next to us. So, like, girls would uh, go lift up their shirts, get their beads, and then come a couple feet down and talk to us, and we'd give them the gospel, you know. It's like, <laughs> like a little sin and repentance assembly line, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and one of the other things I did that was actually very fun was I sang in the church choir uh, at Jerry Falwell's mega church. We don't have sound, so this will be a little muted, but uh, you can see... The church, there are about 350 of us on any given Sunday and uh, in our eggplant-colored robes singing anodyne gospel pop music. And, uh, <laughs> and there's me. And, and my mom would actually, she was supportive in her own way. She would, um, she would watch the broadcasts on, on national TV and she would call me. And after this one, I remember she called me. She was like, you know, you, you, you're the only one that doesn't know the words, right? <laughs> you actually should really study because you're not slick, uh, basically. Um, so um, I stayed at Liberty for a semester and... and um, and by about mid-semester, a couple things were starting to occur to me. One is that I actually enjoyed learning about the Bible. I don't know if, how many of you have formal Bible training, um, but you know, this, these were the kinds of questions I would, I would get on quizzes. And although it wasn't wholly writ to me, this was not my scripture, it wasn't, I didn't believe it was infallible, I still loved learning about it. I mean, I'm, I was a literature major. I ended up being a literature major back at Brown. And what it brought to my understanding of the Western canon was immeasurable. And I think... Um, it's important, you know, I didn't know anything about the Bible. This was a, a change for me, and, and a good one, I thought. Um, the second thing I, I, I noticed was that I was uh, in danger of getting a lot of these. These are reprimand slips, and they accompany your fines and your, your, uh, you know, your punishment. Uh, this was for sleeping in convocation. I, I fell asleep during convocation. Um, <laughs> I didn't get any more, any serious ones. Um, but one of the things that was interesting to me as I went through the semester was... Um, the attitudes of the students uh, there. I, I thought that, you know, since these weren't beaver cleavers, since these were normal, modern college students, most of whom happened to be conservative and, and very religious, but nonetheless up on pop culture, up on the world around them, I, I couldn't understand how they could submit to these draconian rules, how they were so, they were happy. It wasn't like this was a, a campus full of 13,000 miserable people who were made to come there by their parents. And I actually I started to realize um, about midway through this semester that I was actually really enjoying the structure. Um, that, you know, having come from Brown where there are no required classes, no, uh, you know, official forms of advising, I really enjoyed parts of being um, in such a rigid theological community. Um, and there have been interesting studies on this done by secular uh, sociologists. There's a woman named Margarita Mooney at, at Chapel Hill who uh, did a study of religious college students. So not students at religious colleges, but students at any college who practice a religion regularly throughout college. And what she found was that um, almost without exception, these students report being happier. They report uh, being more diligent with their schoolwork, and they end up more satisfied with their college experience. And I didn't get that at the time. I, I, I didn't understand that when I went to Liberty. But as I went through the semester, um, you know, of course there are hard things and bad things, and not every Liberty student is happy, and a lot of them are disgruntled because of the rules. But for the ones who can appreciate, you know, the structure and for whom it's not overbearing, I actually I think it helps them, you know, come to a place where they feel supported. And, uh, and I think it's something that secular universities um, need to emulate. We need to do a better job of advising people and supporting them um, in order to make them feel like they're, they're 
they're not just floating around on their own and, and, and up, you know, that, that their whole direction of their educational path isn't up to them. Um, the third thing was I made friends. These are some of my friends from my dorm. Um, and although I disagreed with them about 99% of things, I mean, really, I couldn't have been more different from them. Um, I didn't find my beliefs changing um, during, during my semester, although there were moments when I felt you know, unmoored and, and that scared me a little bit. Um, but what I did learn is that I could, I could disagree with, with my friends, my, you know, the people on my hall, without having animosity towards them. I could, I could learn from them and, and be um, in a community with them and not agree with them. Um, there were some things that I didn't like at all. Um, one was the creationism. I mean, this is clearly, this is from our science textbook. Um, and it, you can see it's a uh, size comparison for the arc. It says people and dinosaurs are shown to scale. Um, and it's, it has the cubic uh, measurements of the arc and the freight capacity. Um, and this is part of their science curriculum. Every Liberty student has to take this class. Um, so clearly this was something that I was not uh, interested in. This was not something I felt would change, and it, it didn't change. I, I still think it's abhorrent that they teach this. Um, I, I, I don't have any other explanation for that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I tried to understand the, um, the, the moral underpinnings. I tried to understand why a creationist believes the way they do, and, in, and, and I have some theories about that, but I, I think um, it's a shame that, that Liberty still, still teaches this. Um, the other thing was the conservative social agenda. This is from our GNED, or general education class. Um, and it's all about the myths behind the homosexual lifestyle. And, uh, and this is also something that every Liberty student is required to take. Um, so clearly, this was not uh, a place of progressive values. Clearly, it was, it's not a safe space. Um, and that was another thing that bothered me. I, actually, I went to see, they, they had, there's a pastor at Liberty who's, who's charged with taking all the students who are struggling with same-sex attraction as they call it, and, and helping them out of it. Um, that's his, his job duty. And, uh, and I went to see him because I wanted to see what this process looks like. How do you take someone who's gay and, and make them behave as if they're straight? And, uh, and so I walk into his office, and I'm sitting there, and he's like, oh, so what brings you here? And I'm like, well, you know, I have this friend who's, uh, <laughs> who's like, feeling this attraction, and I'm, I'm, like, telling him more and more, and he's looking at me like, sure. You know, that, it's like the 40th time he's heard the I have a friend speech uh, today. <laughs> so, so that did not go well. Uh, but I, I learned a little bit about what that must be like for them. And actually, since the book came out, I've heard from a number of, of Liberty alums who left Liberty and then, you know, eventually came out. Actually, the, the owner of the largest gay nightclub in Philadelphia is a Liberty alumnus. <laughs> so uh, if you ever go there, tell him I sent you. Actually, don't. Um, <laughs> and I, I learned a little bit about the sort of cult worship of, of Jerry Falwell. This is a shirt I, uh, I, that's for sale, in their, or was for sale in their bookstore. Team Jerry. It's not my favorite shirt. I couldn't get a picture of my favorite shirt, but, my, but the one I'm, I, I like the most is a cartoon face of Jerry Falwell, and it says, Jerry is my homeboy above it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a collector's item. Um, and and I, I decided about midway through the semester that, um, that one of the things I wanted to do most during the semester was to meet Jerry Falwell. Um, he was a towering figure in the religious right, and I felt it was important to understand him and understand where he came from and understand his appeal. So I, I got on staff at the student newspaper at Liberty, and midway through my, you know, almost at the end of my semester, I went in to interview him. That's the two of us in his office. And I wrote an, a big article about Jerry Falwell, like the man, the myth, the legend, or something. I mean, clearly this was for Liberty student newspaper, so it couldn't be, uh, you know, a, a critical thing. They vet it for content. Um, and, uh, and he signed my Bible. This is... Uh, this is a collector's item now. Um, so <laughs> to my friend Kevin, Jerry Falwell, Philippians 1.6. Um, and then this article came out uh, in May of my, it was the spring semester. And about two weeks after the article came out, uh, Jerry Falwell died. He had a heart attack and, uh, and died. And so this ended up being the last print interview he ever did. Um, and for me, it was vastly conflicting because here I was at a place where you know, I wasn't being honest about who I was. I was, I was undercover. I was being as honest as I could. Um, but uh, within that, there was a fair bit of deception. And so here's 
you know, someone who trusted me and who let me interview him, and, and, and now he's dead. And, and now this whole school is coping with, with his death. Um, and so that was incredibly hard, and I tried to, to write about that uh, in the book. Um, I want to just, I want to talk a little bit. That, that was sort of my experience at Liberty. Uh, I want to talk about some of the lessons I learned and some of the problems and, and the solutions that I see for people addressing the religious divide like you all are, are doing. Um, some things to keep in mind, and these come primarily from three books written by the guys above. The first would be uh, that, that we have a problem in America with group polarization. Um, Cass Sunstein the, the, wrote a book called Going to Extremes. He's a, a behavioral economist, formerly of Chicago and now of Harvard. And he um, did a bunch of interesting experiments where he would put a group of moderate uh, liberals uh, in a room in, and put a group of moderate conservatives in a room and have them discuss three issues, a, affirmative action, global warming, and gay marriage. And he would have them discuss these for a few hours. And then he, he, beforehand, he would have given them a survey to indicate, you know, sort of take, take note of where their beliefs were. And at the end, he gave them another survey. And he found that almost without exception, the groups had moved to the extremes. So the moderate conservatives were now extreme conservatives. The moderate liberals were now extreme liberals. And so uh, I think when we associate primarily with people who agree with us, or only with people who agree with us, we face these problems. More extremism, less internal diversity within our group, and greater rifts between groups. Um, so I think this is a problem. And what doesn't help is technology. I, you know, technolo the internet was, was supposed to be this great leveler. You know, uh, a, a gay teenager in Tulsa could connect with uh, the gay community in New York without having to, to physically get up and move. Um, and that has happened in, so, in some cases. But what's also happened is this tech-enabled enclaves, these things where we, we get our news. You know, the left gets its news from the Huffington Post. The right gets its news from Fox News. And what we end up with is an echo chamber in which everyone we come in contact with, our news sources, our outlets, they're all right up our alley. They're all us. And we don't get the, the interesting cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, and faceless debate internet comments are like, you know, the bane of humanity. Um, <laughs> but uh, another problem is cultural Ill illiteracy. I, I am guilty as, as sin of this one. Uh, I went to Liberty not knowing anything about the, the, the Bible, Christian culture. 51% uh, of non-evangelical Americans don't know any evangelical Christians, even casually. That's an interesting fact that I, I picked up. Uh, and then there are these ones from Stephen Prothero's book, Religious Literacy, about half of U.S. adults can't name a gospel, 60% can't name five of the Ten Commandments, and, and, uh, and, and ha more than half of high school seniors in America think Sodom and Gomorrah were a married couple. So <laughs> that's, that's, sort of where we, that's sort of where we are today, and I think it's a problem. The solutions, the happy news. Deliberative democracy is what Cass Sunstein calls it, and basically what it means is getting people in a room who don't agree with each other. You know, picture Lincoln's team of rivals or, um, or, or other groups that, that make it their, their cause to bring in alternative points of view. It's what we want in presidential cabinets. It's what we want in corporate boards. And I, and I think, you know, this is part of what Sunstein feels is that we need to, to actively encourage this in the political process um, and in our own social lives. So, uh, you, know, uh, in, you know, maybe if you're a, a liberal and all your friends are liberals, maybe invite you know, the kid who watches Glenn Beck every night, maybe get him to come to dinner and just ask him what he believes and why. And I think, you know, if you, if you do that in the right spirit, it can be really enriching. Um, finding cross-cutting issues. Uh, this is something I, you know, we, we talked about a little earlier, um, or that, you know, we heard about a little earlier, but there are issues that can unite people of, of different faiths and no faith. Um, there are issues, th these are three organizations. Obviously, the Evangelical Climate Initiative is an evangelical group, but they partner with secular climate change groups. Um, and the Poverty Forum is a, is a cross-faith uh, effort and, and includes humanists, and they're trying to address poverty in an ecumenical way. To Write Love on Our Arms started as a Christian organization. It's an anti-teen suicide group um, that now has, has grown beyond its sectarian walls and now includes and partners with all kinds of great secular organizations to reduce teen suicide. And if we can find issues like those, that can unite people of different faiths, um, then, then instead of just shouting at each other and, 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 and evangelizing, we can actually help solve problems. Um, 
and then there's this idea of compassion without conversion. We just, we, we, we need to, to expose ourselves willfully to people who disagree with us. And this has actually gotten me some heat from, from liberal groups. Um, I think if we can find, if we could, and it, and it may be impossible, find a way to teach the Bible as well as other, you know, other, other sacred texts in, in schools, in public schools, um, I think this would go a long way to, uh, to, to closing the distance of the, re- closing the religious gap. Um, I think language and, and information are crucial, and if we know how to talk about religion, and if we know how to talk about the Bible, we can go a long way towards building those kinds of bridges across faith communities and communities of no faith. So that's, that's, that's gotten me some heat for liberals. But I, I do think it's important, and, and I think that, you know, obviously you have to identify a way to do it that wasn't proselytizing, that wasn't having a preacher come up there and, and saying this is fact or teaching it as science. But if you, could, if you could teach it as part of a religious literacy program, I think that'd be a, a huge help. I came up with five challenges for non-theists. This is not part of my normal presentation, but I, I was thinking a lot about the kinds of things I've, I saw at Liberty that I think apply to a community of, of humanists trying to, to, you know, to, to make that a formidable uh, stance in, American, you know, in the American uh, culture. So the first one would be, and I use big words so you guys would be impressed, breaking the apophatic frame. Apoph- apophatic thinking is, is defining things by what they're not rather than what they are. So, uh, and I think some uh, atheists, and I think the humanist movement is designed to break this frame, to say we're not just, we don't just not believe in God, we also believe in some other things. We believe in compassion and charity and the, you know, the power of the human spirit. So I think that's, that's crucial, just as like a, as a marketing, almost a marketing device, and I know that sounds crass, but... But I think a lot of the people uh, at Liberty, so, for example, would confront an atheist and say, so what, what do you believe in? You know, you don't believe in God. What do you believe? What, you know, what do you believe if, if that's not what you believe? Um, restoring teleology, another big word that means something very simple. Teleology basically is, is the study of, of ends and purposes. Teleology is you, when, you, when you can say um, science has a teleology because the ultimate goal is to understand the world or something like that. So um, a liberty student might come to a non-theist and say, so is life meaningless? What's your purpose if you're not living with the expectation of eternal reward? Aren't you just sort of living a meaningless existence? And I think part of the challenge for humanists is to say, we have a purpose. It's not an ethereal purpose. It's a worldly purpose, and it's to, you know, it's to, to make the communities around us better or to make our own minds uh, you know, substantially, like, to, 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 there's work to be done, I think, in any community in taking the mind and refining it to its most compassionate, its most giving, um, its most human potential. And I think that's the teleology that, that needs to be part of, of the humanist movement. And I think, you know, people are doing a good job. I, I just finished uh, Greg Epstein's book, The Harvard Chaplain, who wrote a book called Good Without God. And it's basically about this, how do we define purpose? if we're not theists. Um, it's a great book. Evangelizing with a new evangel. Evangel means good news. So evangelizing, you know, uh, you guys have been doing, you know, conferences and workshops all day about marketing and how to, how to you know, use the media and use your, your communications people to, to spread uh, a message of, of positive, you know, affirmative uh, non-theism rather than just apophatic or negative non-theism. Uh, I think that's important. Um, turning the other cheek, what do you do when Christians insult you? That's a, that's a big problem for non-theists. You know, what do you do when a politician is stumping and he says, oh, you know, if you don't believe in God, you have no morals and you don't have family values. And, I mean, what do you, because you don't want to necessarily, you don't want to come off like a jerk, right? Because that's not part of the humanist project. Um, so what do you do? I think that's a really interesting question is, do you just ignore it? Do you turn the other cheek? Or do you come back with something else? I think that's it's a challenge. I don't know the answer. I think that's something that that um, that we as as non-evangelicals have to work on. Uh, and resisting the herd again. This goes back to the the moderate liberals and the moderate conservatives in a room. Really, it will strengthen your group if at your conventions, at your meetings, you bring in people who disagree with you. I promise you. It's scary. You know, if you can get Glenn Beck, I don't know that uh, <laughs> I don't know what his speaking fee is, but. Seriously, if you can get the local pastor to come in and, and talk about 
you know, how they view the atheist community, how they're reaching out to people. And, and if you can build those kinds of bridges, I promise you your group will be more successful than if you just stay among yourselves. And Christians now are starting to realize this too. They're bringing in um, you know, other faith traditions to try to teach them about the world outside their faith. And I think it's a way of strengthening people and, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's crucial. So I, to this end, I started something called the Jonah Project. In the wake of my book, people were coming up to me and saying, you know, Kevin, how ca- I'm not going to go to Jerry Falwell's college, but I don't know anyone who, doesn't, who disagrees with me, and, and it's, it's killing me, and I want to meet, how do I meet people? What can I talk about with them? So I, I thought of a plan. My publisher and I collaborated, and they said, we'll give you 500 books. And I, I told them I wanted to give the books away for free, two at a time. Um, so you can sign up to get a book but only if you sign up with someone who is of a different faith or no faith, and who, is, who is of a different worldview than you. So if you're a liberal Jew, sign up with a Jehovah's Witness. If you're a non-theist, sign up with the pastor of the local Methodist church. Um, you know, read the book, talk, read the book or, or don't read the book, whatever. I mean, it's not really about the book. It's about you know, having an excuse to bring these people together. Read the book. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter for me. The books are free. So, um, so... Uh, but just talk about it and then record it in some way and we'll post it on the Jonah Project uh, website. All these sort of 250 mini summits that we'll, we're going to get. And so we've given out over 400 books already. Projects are rolling in. Um, and these are some of the people who have been participating. These are two guys. Uh, he was the best man at his wedding. They're, one of them is an atheist and one of them is an evangelical. And they sat down and talked about the book. It was wonderful. Uh, these are just some of the other pairs, and none of them are alike. There are Jews, atheists, Christians, uh, Muslims, uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, um, gay, straight, I mean, everyone. And, and I think part of what I, I've been loving about seeing the responses, I mean, it's not about me and my book. It's about these people and giving them a chance to come together and talk about the po- you know, what they have in common rather than I feel like we spend a lot of time talking about our differences and if we can just you know and, I, and I, that was what brought me to liberty was the differences but what I actually came out most fascinated by was the similarities and the common ground and I came out actually very hopeful and so I have still some friends from, from liberty um, and, and we have uh, genuine friendships despite our, our differences and I think uh, I'm better for it and I hope liberty is too so Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Can we get, like, questions rolling? I just want to just pepper me. I, I'll, I'll answer anything. Yeah, Liz. It was an arsenal. It was the latter, most of the time. I mean, basically what Liberty wants to do with all its freshmen is equip them with the tools that they need to win arguments. Um, and it, and it's, it's not as reductive as that, but they basically say, okay, when someone comes at you saying, you know, what about the fossil record? You know, here are the three things you tell them. Um, when someone comes to you and says, you know, you know, it's it's that sort of thing. It's the it's the opposition research. It's the tit for tat. Um, certainly, there are a lot of people there who do believe that that homosexuality is wrong, um, and immoral, and a sin. Um, I would say the majority, frankly. But um, I think that as time goes on, and and I think um, you know, liberty can't stay that way forever. It won't. It won't. I mean, it, it will never be a safe space. I'd, I'm sad to say, but it will always be. Uh, it, it will always be getting more towards that. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I don't think that's just blind optimism. I think even in the post Falwell era, his son Jerry Falwell Jr. is now running the school, and I think even it is showing signs of sprouting ideological diversity. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's part of the. It's part of the moral architecture that the school was founded on. Yep. Do you ever have any like super notable football cards with your friends? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you see how hard it was to kind of do such a quick one, Eddie, and I guess hide it in the 
<laughs> it was it was tremendously hard. I had a, a whole bunch of slip ups. I I cursed accidentally. You know, I I, uh, I would say things like someone would ask me what I was reading in the Bible, and I would say uh, uh, Philippians, and they'd be like, "You mean Philippians?" You know. So I remember there there was one time I was studying for a um, a New Testament exam, and the the quiz was. Uh, name all 27 books of the New Testament in order. So from Matthew all the way to, to Revelation. And, uh, and here I am the night before, I'm cramming. I'm up at 2 a.m. I'm never going to get this. I keep putting, you know, I keep switching Timothy and Philo. You know, I, I, it's just, it's bad. And I walk out into the hall and I go to one of my friends and I'm like, I, I'm dying here. You got to help me out. And he's like, dude, it's so easy. Just sing the song. <laughs> And I was like, uh, what song? And, he, and then he starts singing this New Testament song. How many of you know the New Testament song? Anyone? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts in the letter to the Romans. Da, da, da. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> and it's a mnemonic that you know, people in, in this world would have learned going to Sunday school. So all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, I, I slipped up a lot to the extent that when I actually came back to Liberty and sort of outed myself after my semester and told all my friends there, they weren't mad. They, their first reaction was just, oh, so that's why, you know. That's why you didn't know the words to Jesus paid at all, you know. That's why you, you uh, called it Philemon. Um, yeah. Um, well, people would ask me more often, it, it's sort of assumed, you know, why would you go there if you didn't believe in God? Why would you subject yourself to those kinds of rules? Um, so there wasn't really a whole lot of interrogation. A couple people asked me, you know, oh, are you a Christian? And I would say yes, because my parents are Quakers, and I grew up as a Quaker, and so I feel comfortable, you know, adopting. Quakers are Christians, technically. They're like Christians light. Um, <laughs> so I felt comfortable saying that. Um, uh, you know, people would ask me if I, where I came from, and I would tell them that I came from Brown University, and I expected that this would set all of their their, their red flags up. Well, actually, what it, they just felt bad for me. They assumed that I was fleeing <laughs> Brown because it was so secular. I just couldn't take it anymore. So they would say, "Oh, like you must be so relieved. Liberty must be such a breath of fresh air for you." <laughs> I'd be like, uh, "You have no idea." <laughs> yeah. So. Good. They did. Um, I, I sat down with Jerry Falwell Jr. before the book came out, and I've been back to Lynchburg a few times. I actually went there for a book signing, um, and, uh, and that was wild. I'll, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. But they, they've been um, marginally accepting of it. I mean, they, they, uh, they sell the book in the campus bookstore, but they sell it with a page-long disclaimer inside every copy that says, this is not true, basically. <laughs> um, so, and that's disappointing, but it was, it was good of them. I mean, at first they banned the book. They said, we're not going to sell it on campus. And then they had actually a faculty member speak up and say, no, I think this is actually really important for our students to read. So they had a faculty committee vote and they voted three to two to stock the book in the bookstore. And, um, and so they've been not only accepting, but actually excited about it. I think there are a lot of people at Liberty who feel marginalized and outcasted because it's such a rigid school that you can't possibly fit in 100% unless you're Jerry Falwell. And so I think everyone from time to time at Liberty walks around feeling a little bit like an imposter. And I think, you know, I've gotten a lot of letters and emails from Liberty students who say basically, you know, I'm glad it's not just me. And I think that that's, that's really heartening for me. I, they haven't officially endorsed the book. I mean, they're not going to be, you know, uh, getting me on the 700 Club or anything. I mean, I, did, I was on the 700 Club, but not because of them. But they, uh, they, they have been as gracious as I think they, they can be about it. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, no. No. Was it a private high school? Okay, I, I, I don't speak to every public school. I, I went to public school uh, most of my life and, and never really got any Bible training. Yep. Did you ever, were you ever in like Bible class where someone expressed any kind of doubt or like maybe considering like other worldviews or anything like that and you may have wanted to speak up or you have any of that? Well, I wasn't there as an activist, right? So my job was just to sort of document and, and immerse myself. but. There was doubt. I mean, it, less so in the classroom. Um, just because these classes are so large, they're all intro classes. They're you know 100 or 200 people. There wasn't really much talk back um, during the class. But in the dorms, late at night, guys would stay up and have these round tables where they would just they would go in each other's rooms and and eat Cheetos and play video games and talk about the Bible. And some of them would say, oh, this doesn't really make sense, or like, why, why does this contradict this, or why, you know, like, what's up with <laughs> Revelation? And, and, uh, and, and they would talk about this stuff and doubt it and question it, and it just wasn't part of the curriculum. Um, in, in class, it would be sort of like what, what Liz said, which is that, you know, so professor, uh, you know, this, this thing about God resting on the seventh day why would he need to rest? Does he get tired? You know, does God get tired? He's God. Why would he get, you know, so then, and then they would sort of give you the ammo to make that fit. They would say, oh, well, the Hebrew translation of that word doesn't actually mean rested. It just means, you know, refreshed himself or something like that. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm really curious how they made the science, the science books, the dimensions of the ark. The Bible lists Oh, they said they said they were teenage dinosaurs. So they I'm serious. This was like a whole day of class. Um, and they they I and 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 this is, you know, illustrative of how actually so here's here's the thing, and I learned this at Liberty, is that creationists are not stupid. My professor was uh, was so much better at, at everything related to science and quantitative biology and, than I was, and that I ever will be. He's a credentialed PhD. It takes a lot of intelligence to be able to bend the evidence like that. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You, you, you have to be incredible. The gymnastics required to believe that dinosaurs were on the ark. I mean, so not only were they teenage dinosaurs, but they were, because they couldn't fit all the animals and all the food they would need for that trip. So he said they were, they were in estivation, which is a comatose-like state where you don't need to eat as much. Um, so that's how they would have been able to reduce the food supply. I mean, the, 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 it's not, the, the science class doesn't just consist of pointing to Genesis and saying that's how it happened. It's, it's really, it takes the shape of a legitimate scientific inquiry. Um, and so it, it's, it's actually hard. I mean, I, I struggled in class. It was not just, you know, kids' stories. So it, it was it was very interesting in that way. Yep. I think the point you made uh, between the conversations between two diverse groups is very important because when I was in India, there was a lot of animosity towards Pakistan and the North and the and everything. And once I came to the US, I made friends with Pakistani people and we realized, like, yeah, like you, you may have some different ideas, but still, there are people, there are friends and stuff like that. So I think. That's great. I, I, I watch Glenn Beck, you know, so we, so we're... Yeah, I watch Glenn Beck too, stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's a very good point because the more you go into one, you become more and more isolated and you don't understand. Right, well, and in situations like that, in, in, in foreign policy situations, it really can mean the difference between life and death. Um, there's a group called Seeds of Peace uh, that, that does an amazing program with Palestinian and Israeli youth where they send them to summer camp together and the idea is that in 30 years, if you do enough of these camps, you're going to have a generation of leaders in both countries who understand the humanity of the other side. Because they'll, they'll remember you know, 
being on the jungle gym with them or whatever. I mean, I think this is, it's, we can say it's, it's utopian as an ideal, but it really can mean the difference between um, life and death. It can mean the, the health of communities and countries. It's, it's vital, especially in a place like, like India and Pakistan or Israeli and Palestine, Israel and Palestine. Right. No. I, and I and I think that's and I think it, it's for for the, a non-theist group. It's it's um it's imperative that that you guys get inside. You know, spend time in religious communities because you may be the only non-theist they ever meet. You know, people at Liberty, some of them had a lot of contact with people of other faiths, but I think a lot of them probably had never actually been close to or or friends with. A gay person, um, a Muslim, a non-theist, and I think so. Their 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 antipathy is not some in, some born and bred. They're not jerks. They just don't know. And I think um, what we can do is is to read the other newspaper, re- read the other side's newspaper, watch their TV show, get a handle on on what these people believe and how you would talk to them about it. So. I think that's important. Thanks. Uh, Jesse. Uh, you talked about the importance of both focusing on what we have in common and on discussing differences. What do you think are some examples of times that we should focus on what we have in common versus uh, push back against where we think people are incorrect? So I think um, focusing on, so th- there have been some interesting studies also about moral beliefs, beliefs that we tie to our morals and how those are much stronger and, and much harder for us to budge on than, than issues that are simply political or cultural. Um, and I think when we should really resort to, when we should really discuss similarities is in issues that are in stalemate, like abortion. It is going to be a long time before the abortion debate ends. There are always going to be people who, who think it's immoral and wrong, and there are always going to be people who think it's a fundamental right. And so what do you do? Do you just keep yelling? Do you just keep picketing um, and protesting? Or you know, what, what some people have tried to do is, is to reframe it and say, OK, how can we reduce the number of abortions? How can we keep abortion legal and reduce the number of, of people who need abortions? You know, can we do that through comprehensive sex ed? And actually, you know, the, right, the, the pro-life movement has actually sort of been surprisingly open to this, saying, okay, if we, if we teach better sex ed in schools, then, people, then fewer women will actually have to make that choice, and we'll wind up with fewer abortions and fewer you know, murders as they see it. So I think you can actually sort of, through using conciliatory language and being open to compromise, I think you can, you can come, even on the, the most binary issues, you can come sort of to a third way. Like, you know, Bill Clinton's famous for saying the third, finding the third way. So I think you can, you can do that with some of those issues. Yeah. Uh, is there anything any time that you guys feel like you change your mind to, or uh, will you even be like, open to the possibility that you might change your mind on any little thing, or even something more major about what you already believe? Of course. I mean, I, I think I would be lying if I said that I was steadfast and, and solid through my whole semester. This is a system and a, and a school that is very, very good at converting skepticism to belief. They're really good at it. And you go to these services, and they have the 10-piece the, the band and the laser light show and the pastor <laughs> whose only job it is to motivate people and who's one of the best in the country at that, and they're, they're standing in front of you. And yeah, there were times that I felt like, okay, well, here goes my journalism project. You know, sign me up for seminary. Like, and there'd be moments when that happened, and and at first it scared me. And 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 I think what it is is that we just don't have secular equivalents of that experience. It's uh, Emil Durkheim had a, a phrase, collective effervescence. Um, that is, it's the feeling when you have a group of people all thinking and believing and acting in the same ways. And really, if you think about it, the only times we feel that outside of religious communities, okay, maybe a concert, maybe a sports game, 
maybe a rally of some sort, but the, the euphoric feeling of being part of a social organism. And they have that three times a week. You know? So you can imagine when that happens over and over to you. I mean, I was, I was as different as they come, and even I was feeling very tempted. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I was not uh, as resistant as, as I thought I would be. Sure. That actually changed my mind. Yeah, I, I think to a lesser extent, but there were some issues like that. I mean, I think um, on something like abortion, you know, I'm I come from a, a family of feminists, and my my mom was a second wave feminist. Work with Gloria Steinem. I mean, I I couldn't be more sympathetic to that cause. But I did sort of start to see um, the moral gravity of that decision. I think um, we on the left uh, tend to think that people who are pro-life just haven't thought about the issue enough. And I actually saw, heard people explain their stances, and, and, and these are not people who take a casual interest. They've, they've weighed the moral choice. And, and I think one of the things that I changed my mind about is thinking that this is somehow a, a political issue. It's a moral issue. It's a moral choice um, about whether you think women should have the right to terminate their pregnancy or not. And it, it's not to say that, that the two sides are morally equivalent. I still, I'm still pro-choice, but I don't think anyone takes that decision lightly. And so I think that's something where I, I, I didn't necessarily change my, my mind, but I, it really changed the way I thought about the issue. Yeah. Take a couple more. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier. So what perception of uh, non-religious people kind of exists in the It was a simplistic one. I mean, it's, you know, they think we're all pond scum and we don't, you know, our lives don't, you know, that, you know, why would you be an atheist? You wouldn't have a reason to get up in the morning, basically. <laughs> um, and it's infantilizing and, it, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's wrong. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I think... To a certain extent, actually, this is something that I, I haven't talked about, but it's in the book. Um, there was a debate during my time there. A, a pastor from Liberty uh, got into a debate on the radio with a group called the Rational Response Squad. You guys know them? So Liberty's star pastor uh, debated them on the radio. And it was fascinating. The whole campus, it was like, you know, gearing up for the big football game. Like, literally, people like, oh, where are you watching? You're like, where are you listening to the debate tonight? You want to come over and listen to the debate at my house? Like, we'll get some nachos, and you can listen. It was like everyone on campus was going to tune into this thing and watch the pastor, like, dig into the atheists. And then it happened, and he got his ass kicked. <laughs> no, he, he really did. It was, it was really brutal. And, uh, and so the next day, people were sort of walking around like, what happened? <laughs> like, you know, we were the, you know, we were the, the Duke and they were the, you know, Fresno State. And, and like, what happened? And, and, but I think what was, what was depressing about that to me is like, no one changed their minds. No one lost, you know, it wasn't a cataclysmic event at Liberty. I mean, people were sort of stunned that this guy had sort of lost face, but it didn't change anyone's mind about theology. And I think that's really instructive for people who are thinking about how to approach these matters is a debate changes no one's mind, I don't think. Um, it, it solidifies the opinions that are already in place, but in the end, the choice to be religious um, and be at a place like liberty, uh, it's not Logical. I mean, and that, and I don't mean that in a I mean that in a value neutral way. It is not based. It's not predicated upon logic. There are other reasons, um, and so even if you rip the the logical foundations out or tinker with them a bit, what you're going to find is is that people are still attached to it for reasons that have nothing to do with whether Titus conflicts with, you know, Hezekiah. It's it's not a, it's not about that to them. Yeah, in the back, and then I think we'll do. Should we do two more? Let's do two more. Um, falling asleep at convocation was ten dollars, I think, maybe twenty dollars. It got up to, like, if you're, 
uh, there was a guy on my hall who uh, who went two guys on my hall who went to a lingerie party together at a neighboring school. So they, they snuck out, they went to this lingerie party, they were in their underwear with you know secular college kids drinking and and uh, one of the guys, idiot, came back and posted the pictures on his MySpace page. <laughs> and he gets called into the dean's office uh, and the dean just spreads the printed pictures out before him. <laughs> The guy's like, oh, you know, here I go. I think his fine was like $700. And like, <laughs> he got like 85 reprimands. It was, I mean, like 25 or 30 is enough to get you suspended or kicked out. So it, at that point, it was, you know, like sentencing someone to 25 consecutive life sentences. It was like <laughs> above him. They just wanted to make really sure he was expelled. Yeah. Oh, the book signing in Lynchburg. Uh, that was funny. So, so I went to a book signing in Lynchburg um, when the, right when the book came out, and there were a ton of people turned out, I think, just to see whether I you know, had horns or, or whatever. Uh, and and this, this nice uh, old lady followed me to the bathroom <laughs> at the signing. She walked all the way across the Barnes & Noble and waited for me outside the bathroom while I went in. And I came out, and she was standing there with sort of this grave look on her face, and she said, you know, Mr. Roos, God is going to judge you. <laughs> but I love your book. Would you sign it for me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was the nicest condemnation in history. It was, it was like, it's like, sure, why not? You know, God will judge me. So what? You're, you're very nice. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think that that they, uh, they have some dissonance too about stuff like that. Go ahead. Can you discuss the terms of your slavery to A.J. Jacobs? Yes, I was, I was, uh, I was an intern to A.J. Jacobs, but I, I, I wrote to him and wanted to work for him. He's a, he's a best-selling author and, and a great guy. And he was working on this book about trying to follow all the rules of the Bible for an entire year. So everything from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers and you know, all, you know, all, everything, completely literally. It's a hilarious book. Um, and, uh, and so he wrote back, and he's like, sure, you could be my intern, but I've actually been having a lot of trouble following the parts of the rules of the Bible about slavery in the Old Testament. <laughs> so is it okay if I call you my biblical slave? You know, is that... <laughs> so, and, and I came back, and I was like, well, do I have to put that on my resume? Can I put <laughs> research assistant on my res... You know, can I... So he, he agreed. But it was, it was a great internship. I would spend, like... You know, it was sort of a bizarre juxtaposition of tasks. Like I would go get his dry cleaning, and then I would have to go, you know, find an astrologer to stone. In times, so it's like, like <laughs> it was like half and half there. So, uh, thank you guys. You guys have been so great. Thank you for having me.